Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Thanks so much. It's good. It's a good week to be talking about free speech and social media, um, and especially with you, given you were getting banned from social media before it was cool. So very happy. Yeah, to yeah. I mean, everyone should have uh, paid closer attention. I suppose I wasn't the only one, but I, I feel like I was one of the silliest bands. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, so primarily I'm interested in the topic of free speech in mm. general these days, um, because I feel that it's so precarious and lacks in defenses from places where it should be being defended, I suppose. But I did, I really liked your article that was just published in, um, the times, mm which was, I think, titled Their IT Guys and We Let Them Silence a President. And I shared that online and I had posted my own video online saying, you know, the banning of Trump is not a good thing. Um, mm. But, you know, the response, the response to your article on my end when I posted it was, I suppose, predictably, but still frustratingly, that, you know, people act as though... It, I'm supporting Trump. People said that I was posting pro-fascist sure. stuff. <laughs> I was like, mm, I'm not, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, good luck with that. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, it's not like the issue really isn't about Trump. It's about the the precedent. Um, maybe what's the issue for you? What are you concerned about? I think the Trump thing in particular, when he got booted off of Facebook and then Twitter, because it just felt like such an escalation of the power of big tech over free speech and over the online sphere. Because as you've experienced, as we've been, at Spikes have been writing out for a long time, there has been this encroachment into policing more and more areas of speech. Some of that will probably get into hate speech, what is dubbed misinformation, all kinds of things. But there was something about the Trump ban which felt like a Rubicon had been crossed. Because even Twitter and Facebook, as kind of censorious as they had become, um, they would catch a lot of flack because they refused to ban Donald Trump. It was this kind of slightly absurd demand from a lot of people on, on the left and so-called liberals for a long time. You've got to delete his tweets. You've got to ban his account. Hasn't he violated your terms of service? And they said quite reasonably, he's the president of the United States. <laughs> people should kind of know what he's up to and what he's saying. You know, there is it's obvious that it would be absurd to do this. So the fact that they decided to move, granted, it was just like a couple of weeks before the inauguration of Biden, but still, it felt like a line had been crossed. And one of the things that's so on the, the basic thing about it is if it can happen to Donald Trump, it can happen to basically anyone. I think people should bear that in mind. But also as an assertion of the will and almost like as they see it, the right of big tech to basically meddle in democratic politics, even at that highest level, just to silence the leader of the free world, I think means that they feel that their power is basically uninhibited at this point. This really could go anywhere. And it just really surprises me that so many people particularly on the left, seems so chilled out about this. I mean, a lot of people, I'm sure you've seen this as well, have become odd, almost lib ultra-libertarian defenders of the free market and the right of these companies as private institutions to do what they say. Um, whereas, again, if that power can be wielded against Trump, there's no saying that that can't be wielded against someone you're sympathetic to. And I think the, the response we've seen from other world leaders since then, um, President of Mexico, Angela Merkel, some others, I think just demonstrates that even... People who aren't necessarily like Merkel, particularly great on freedom of speech, have recognised what a line has been crossed here. Because this isn't going to, this didn't start with Donald Trump. It's not going to end with him either. And it just shocks me that people haven't really realised that yet. Yeah, me too. I mean, it surprises me that people don't see the big picture here. Like you say, you know, if, if these companies can silence, censor, ban the president then everyone is vulnerable. You know, when it's people like me, for example, or someone even less less known, you know, some Anon or whatever, I think, I mean, I think first of all, people assume that you actually did something wrong and you're lying about it. Like, you're like, <laughs> okay, but be serious. You did threaten to kill someone, right? Um, but of course, I, I, I didn't. Um, and... You know, and they just think, oh, well, you know, go somewhere else, go to a different platform. I mean, what's the difference? It's just Twitter. Like, it's just Facebook. It's not the end of the world. Um, and of course, Trump was banned from every platform. Like, it wasn't just Twitter. It was Facebook. 
It was uh, YouTube. It was Snapchat, Reddit. Um, I think I, I recently read that, you know, he or his supporters were banned from PayPal and Stripe, mm. um, you know, Spotify. And so, yeah, a lot of people, I mean, I suppose a lot of people say the same thing about him, which is like, well, you know, he, he incited violence. You know, he broke Twitter rules. This was the final straw. But why do you think now as opposed, I mean, he's tweeted all sorts of crazy stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, depending on, depending on how you look at it, harmful stuff or dangerous stuff, certainly misleading or, or false things, lies. Um, why now? I think in a sense, it was just the pressure that they had come under. I mean, it was almost accepted that he was going to get banned as soon as he handed over the keys to the White House. You know, that was kind of already provided for. I don't think they should have done that, but it was kind of seen as, as soon as they had a little bit of cover. Because I think the social media companies, and this is one thing that I don't think is fully appreciated, is that whilst the people who run them definitely have a certain political bias, shall we say, <clears throat> and internally there's a lot of pressure from the, from the people who work there who tend to be quite left liberal to kind of woke authoritarian generally in their politics a lot of stories about them going into open revolt trying to get trump shut down before this but also they've been coming under a lot of pressure from the media from politicians in the u.s particularly the sort of democratic establishment to do something like this for a very long time and i think the moment itself after the storming of the capital just provided sufficient kind of like moral cover for them to do this um, and the moment was such that it was a significant moment of tension that they felt they could do it and get plaudits rather than get criticised. And I think that's important to underline because this argument that was about him inciting violence, if you look at actually Twitter's published rationale as to why they got rid of his account finally, they cite two tweets, one of which is him calling the 75 million people who voted for him great American patriots or something to this degree. And then another tweet which talks about uh, if anyone's asking, I'm not going to the inauguration. And they somehow, via these kind of amazing mental gymnastics, and managed to construe this as incitement to violence. They say when he was calling them great Americans, he was talking about the people who stormed the Capitol, which obviously isn't true. And on the second tweet, him saying he just wasn't going to be there at the inauguration, they managed to say that this was him sending a signal to his supporters that this event was a safe event for them to attack because he wasn't going to be there. <laughs> so it's obvious that they were looking for excuses at this point. Now, has Trump said some inflammatory things online and off over the course of the last four years and even before? Of course he has. But I think it's so obvious that this is brought part of a kind of broader turn in Silicon Valley, pushed very much by commentators and the political establishment, which is basically that Trump is a kind of um, virus that needs to be purged. Trumpism, all of his supporters are just some people who should not really get a say in public life. And the moment of the capital in particular, I, I think just became a kind of pretext in which to push through that purge, really. I mean, again, if you look at these bans on their own terms, it really doesn't stack up the arguments they're making for themselves. Right. I mean, as far as I could tell, those particular tweets didn't technically constitute incitement to violence whether he meant them to or not mm. but i mean i i just i don't trust twitter to determine meaning you know essentially mm. if we're going to say well he was inciting violence so therefore he should be banned from twitter he broke the twitter rules i mean we're giving twitter the power to read people's minds um to thought police um and to interpret, yeah, to interpret meaning, which which I find incredibly sketchy. Mm. It's so strange. The, and the willingness of people just hand over all of this stuff. And you see this with some of the um, clampdowns in relation to misinformation, which is something that particularly over the course of the last year in the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of the social media companies have in their minds kind of stood up and decided we're going to take a much more active role in clamping down in what is deemed to be misinformation, the definition of which, definition of which seems to just be anything that goes against what the WHO or public health authorities say, which is a bit sketchy because, you know, what they've said over the course of this pandemic has changed quite a few times, um, as it has for many people. Um, that's a really dangerous place to be. And that one in particular, I find shocking. We've seen it in relation to Trump and obviously the fact checks on his genuinely batshit crazy ideas about election fraud and all the rest of it, is the fact that you're inviting these huge, unaccountable Silicon Valley companies to basically hold forth on what is and isn't true, now, obviously, there's certain things that we see and that we recognise is nonsense, is conspiracy theories and whatever, but you cannot empower any institution, whether it's corporate, state, whatever, 
to basically rule on what is fact and what isn't, what is true and what isn't. That's something that we come to terms with together. And people are also entitled to their own crazy views if they happen to hold them. But that's another thing which seems to have happened over the course of the past couple of years. I think COVID has been a part of it, the kind of slight level of hysteria that's stirred up, especially if people have gone through a very difficult year. But Trump in particular seems to have been a kind of catalyst whereby any of the kind of previous free speech principles we might have had or wariness about the power of these huge kind of monopolistic companies has gone completely out the window, all to the end of just felling this person who is unpleasant and people disagree with. It, it really does feel as simple as that, that just a lot of people's usual kind of scepticism or liberal leanings or concerns about the overreach of these huge companies has just gone because they hate Donald Trump that much. And mm -hmm. that one of the most alarming things about all of this because there's a bit of an awakening now you're seeing some people basically saying i agree with these bands but doesn't it show the terrifying power of these social media companies but that's not good enough obviously because they've handed the power to these companies it's be very hard to pull it back again. yeah i mean do you buy that so you're right you know when it comes to covid um and when it comes to trump i mean those are probably biggest things that I can think of in terms of what these companies have decided that they want to censor. There's also the, you know, a gender identity thing. They've decided to censor or ban people who don't go along with that particular ideology in particular ways. I mean, even right now I'm being careful of my language. Mm -hmm. um, but uh do you think that they genuinely are trying to do good? You know, are they trying to prevent hate or prevent misinformation from spreading or, or you know, what they believe to be misinformation about COVID or the lockdowns or masks or what have you that they think, oh, well, if people spread this information, that will cause harm, that will cause the pandemic to worsen, people will get sick, people will get die, people will die if we allow people to talk about their beliefs about election fraud, then this will cause riots and chaos and violence or a civil war or something like that. Or, you know, or do they have other motivations? It's very difficult to tell because on the one hand you do see on the part of these billionaires there is a bit of a god complex going on with some of them i no doubt think that they believe that their actions are very significant because they are significant i think they genuinely think that they can kind of you know remake the world in their image to some extent or in a, in a better more progressive pace than it was previously i'm sure there's a bit of that going on with some of them it's hard to tell because who who knows what their motivations are in a lot of this but i think it's also worth coming back to the point that it would be bad enough if this was kind of the emergence of these like little online benevolent dictatorships, you know, that they kind of took power, they decided they were going to take all these decisions, they decided they were going to be the person who ruled and what was hate and what was misinformation and what was that. That would be quite terrifying in and of itself. But they have been kind of gifted this power. You know, Twitter and Facebook are quite interesting because they started off with broadly kind of libertarian philosophies, or at least that's how they kind of would describe themselves. I think in some respects that's kind of self-serving because they don't want to get drawn into a discussion about having to make these kinds of decisions. That's fraught with political controversy. That's fraught with peril. But at the same time, that's where they kind of started off. But you see over the course of the past five years in particular, I think, just them being pushed more and more in the direction of censorship. You know, originally it was around hate speech, then misinformation more or less came into came into the frame, particularly in the course of this year. It's actually interesting when I think Alex Jones of Infowars fame, kind of very famous, crazy online conspiracy theorist, when he was banned from Twitter two years ago, or Facebook, sorry, two years ago, they were at pains to say that this wasn't because he was a conspiracy theorist. They were like, it's because it was because of hate speech, it was inciting violence, because again, there was only a line up to which they would move at that point. But over the course of the past year in particular, that combination of Trump and COVID, has just made them completely bolt in the direction of, of censorship. And it's because they've been constantly harangued, basically, <laughs> from the media, from various different governments around the world. They've been told that they're responsible for the rise of populism, or, which is seen in very negative terms by the elite. They're told they're responsible for the spreading of online hate and misinformation and conspiracy theories. Um, and I think, again, because they've got quite a high opinion of themselves, they probably think that's quite true. <laughs> so, they, so this is something which they have amassed all of this terrifying power but also the kind of moral legitimacy with which they now um, exercise it that was given to them I think by a lot of people in politics and and the media would basically be saying even after Trump was banned the main response was what took you so long and I think that just reminds you a little bit of, of where a lot of these demands has been coming from it's not something that's necessarily originated with them in the first place.
Do you think that there are people who should be banned from social media? Do you think Trump should have been banned from social media? I don't definitely don't think Trump should have been banned from social media from what we're talking about. And I think the issue is the size of these platforms specifically, you know, because again, if we were talking about there being a genuine kind of multiplicity that might of different platforms doing different kinds of things or different kind of, you know, sub platforms within platforms. Like no one's suggesting that if you were trying to have a discreet little Facebook book, Facebook group about some kind of interest, that if that anyone should have a right to wade into that discussion and take you down a terrible kind of rabbit hole of argument, even when that's not what you're there to do. And there might be discrete platforms where it's not appropriate to have a kind of free for all. But again, what we're talking about here on basically quite monopolistic platforms you know facebook has what 2.7 billion monthly regular users um it basically is a large part of what now constitutes the public square and therefore we need to treat that very differently to the way we would a business or a pub or a restaurant or all these other kind of quite spurious examples you or i might have heard over recent days you know people saying well you can get kicked off of Twitter because it's a private company. It can set its own rules. You wouldn't go into a shop or a bar and start upsetting the other customer, shouting your mouth off, and then not expect to be, you know, shown the door. These are entirely different things. You know, unless that pub in question could contain millions of people and for some reason was the only place where most political discussion happened these days, you might have a point. But this is something very, very different. And I think the refusal to recognise the power that these platforms have and the space that they occupy in our politics, because so many people use Facebook, so many people who are kind of in the media and politics use Twitter, it's where the news agenda is set. You've got to recognise that we're dealing with something very different than a kind of discrete little platform where people share ideas or engage in a particular interest. This is what constitutes the public square. And therefore, if we are serious about free speech, not just like in a narrow legal sense, but in a much more real kind of material sense, we need to take that kind of censorship seriously. And that means, I think, having as free and open a, a a sphere on social media as is as is possible it's always difficult because of how different countries will do things etc but i think we've always, always got to start from the the standpoint of saying this is the new public square and if we want it to be a, a free and open space then we can't really just let these arguments about them being private companies that can set their own rules just end that discussion mm -hmm. i mean so can i mean can we genuinely address this as a free speech issue when of course there is always the excuse and, you know, people respond to me in this way all the time saying, you know, you don't have a right to use Twitter. Like you say, these are these are private companies. Essentially, they can decide who is allowed to access their services. And I mean, that does make sense technically, mm -hmm. but in reality, it, it doesn't make so much sense because because they have so much control now over the public sphere, because they control the kind of information we can access, the kind of news that is allowed to be reported. Um, I mean, but how do we go about making that argument that this this really is about free speech? Because people will always respond and say, well, the government isn't censoring you. This isn't state censor censorship, so it doesn't count. Well, I think, it's, as you say, it's so important you take that up because free speech is not just like a narrow legal right. I mean, some of the greatest writers and thinkers on freedom of speech recognise this. You know, John Stuart Mill, his famous essay on liberty. He spends a lot of that talking about the censorship that can be enforced by means other than the state. You know, he talks a lot about self-censorship. He talks a lot about, again, the ways in which society can find ways to punish you, basically, for holding dissenting opinions. People who have been thinking deeply about freedom of speech have recognised for a very long time this isn't about the narrow legal rights afforded to you, that there are other means through which um, you can be silenced or you can silence yourself, effectively. So it's important to draw that out. I think it's also important to point out that a lot of people who have suddenly become great converts to the rights of these billionaires claim to be on the left. And it's worth pointing out to these people, why are you so comfortable <laughs> giving these people not just kind of monopoly power in a kind of economic sense over huge parts of the kind of infrastructure of the internet, but over what we can think and say effectively. I, I, the answer, as we all know, is basically just narrowly partisan, but it's important to push that on people because it's absurd that they're being, they're so casually kind of giving them this power. And I think that the other thing about this argument about, well, you can leave Twitter you can join an alternative, you can set up an alternative. I think that argument is flawed, but it was a bit easier to make before this week because this week we saw what happened with Parler, which is this sort of free speech libertarian alternative to Twitter, which was basically just booted off the internet entirely because the 
big tech companies got together and decided to get rid of it. So first of all, you had Apple and Google remove it from its app stores, which basically meant anyone who was trying to download that app on the vast majority of smartphones in the world would not then be able to. Um, then you saw Amazon Web Services, which is, of course, one of the biggest cloud-based web services in the world, completely rescinded its hosting of that. What gave them 24 hours to get lost, basically. And as a result of that, now no one can access it. <laughs> they're, they're constantly scrabbling around trying to look for alternatives. Even other companies, you spoke about Stripe earlier, um, you know, Stripe have stopped working with them. So we've gone from people saying you need to set up, you know, you don't have to use Twitter, you can go elsewhere, or you can set up your own alternative to you also have to set up your own app stores, you have to set up your own <laughs> web services, you have to set up your own payment. There's a certain point in which you have to admit that these companies are in control, not just of these platforms, but like the infrastructure of the internet effectively. And I just don't understand how anyone, particularly anyone on the left, is comfortable with that. They must recognize that that's a threat to free speech, even if it's not a threat to free speech in the kind of narrow legalistic sense in which we normally talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I've I've been totally confused about why leftists would defend corporations having this kind of power, because that's what it is at the end of the day. These are corporations, they're profit-driven, um, their monopolies at this point, and the left are making, you know, the left, not the right, the left are making excuses for them. Why, how did we come to this point? It's a really good question. And on the one hand, you think a lot of this is kind of just narrowly partisan. It's hard, it's hard to get away from that. We've already talked about that a bit, which is to say, for whatever reason, people associate, kind of rightly discern that a lot of people in Silicon Valley we could say it's opportunistic. We could say um, there is actually a strong constituency, but nevertheless, it has a certain political outlook. You know, broadly speaking, it thinks of itself as left wing, although not particularly left wing. It's quite woke. It's quite authoritarian. You know, it has all of those kind of inbuilt prejudices, which um, also lead it to be very hostile to freedom of speech. You know, they, they kind of see it as an ally in some way, shape or form in, in the narrow kind of battle of trying to again, just kind of crush people they dislike. That's definitely part of it. Why people can't recognize that, as with state censorship, you know, as soon as you basically create an excuse for corporate censorship, it's not going to only be used against people you happen to dislike. And actually, coming back to that point about these companies are self-interested and they're wary of bad PR, we've seen in recent years kind of tit-for-tat left-right censorship on the basis of these platforms to try and give themselves some cover. So I remember a few years ago, there were a few... Um, far right groups, if I'm remembering correctly, who were kind of denied access um, to PayPal. You then saw a kind of op opposite reaction in relation to Antifa organizations, the kind of an anarchist pages and things like this, because just trying to create the illusion <laughs> that this is a slightly more even handed thing. And whilst I don't think, you know, we'd be lying if we were suggesting that censorship, particularly online, wasn't largely speaking in one direction at the moment, at the same time, you have created a weapon which could be used against you later on down the line. And I think the other thing is that it has been that this revealing process of the past five years, which has shown that a lot of people on the left, broadly speaking, have become incredibly elitist and incredibly fearful of kind of the mob. And that's what that storming of the Capitol, that's what they think Trumpism is, or that's what they think Trump's voters are all like. If they all got the chance, they'd be going up there trying to hang Mike Pence and you know rip apart Nancy Pelosi's office. These are the ones who just got lucky. This is their kind of, in, in a sense, how they think of these people in the first place. And I think the way in which so many people on the liberal left in particular, but also more the far left, have become so detached and kind of fearful of the mob, as they would see it, in the general sense, not just that mob on Capitol Hill, the more they have looked to corporations as almost being like the agents of change. <laughs> like they have to see them as being the more kind of moral actors at this point because they're so have so much of this kind of fear and loathing of ordinary people. So as I say, part of it I think is just kind of narrow and partisan. They recognize these organizations as a kind of current ally, but I think a lot of it is, as is so often the case, they're so hostile to freedom of speech because they're kind of hostile to ordinary people. They don't trust them. They don't think they should be able to see Trump's tweets or talk about QAnon or whatever it is. Um, and I think that's what we've seen come to the surface and why Trump has been such a kind of engine of censoriousness because it brings together all of those sorts of prejudices. Yeah, it's true. I think that the left has sort of taken up this position wherein regular people are too stupid to make good decisions for themselves and therefore they're dangerous you know they can't be trusted essentially um and it, i mean it's interesting because to me there was this obvious hypocrisy around how progressives responded to the black lives matter 
protests in the summer, some of which turned into violent and dangerous rioting. Um, and that went on for months and months and months. And, you know, essentially that was all sponsored by corporations, <laughs> not literally sponsored, but they all signed on, you know, like Amazon, Nike, Twitter, they were, they were promoting this activism, let's say, um, this political ideology, uh, these mantras, as were the Democrats. Um, and I mean, it could be argued that there, these people, many of these people online were inciting violence. Um, and yet, of course, they weren't banned. And I mean, essentially, you, you weren't even allowed to criticize these events um, and these activists as a progressive. Um, and if you did, then you're a white supremacist or a fascist or a Nazi or, you know, any of those terms that no longer seem to have any real meaning. Um, but yeah, I mean, the you could say, okay, well, Trump's tweets incite violence, um, but why can't you say the same thing when it comes to people who are on your side? Mm. No, the hypocrisy of that has been absolutely crazy. Like, it was so striking as well when you think about the days and days of carnage. And now I get that for a lot of Americans, the storming of the Capitol is a very symbolic thing. And obviously this was a violence um, and rioting to the end of trying to disrupt a democratic process. That's serious in its own kind of way. But when you think about the kind of sustained attack that um, various public buildings came under in the wake of those kind of George Floyd protests, you know, federal courthouses, a police station being set on fire, um, you know, people setting up basically little encampments where the state wasn't allowed to intervene whatsoever and people ended up dying as a result of this. This is very, very serious stuff. And I think the double standards on that is something which it's incredible that no one is really owning up to. Because as you say, there was this sort of looking the other way when a lot of that was going on, despite the fact it was quite clear that whilst there were the peaceful protesters who would often be there during the day and would often have arguments with the with the kind of outsider elements who would come in to try and stir shit up in the evenings. There was this kind of sustained, nihilistic, base, very destructive kind of tendency, which in some respects is quite reminiscent of some of the more extreme kind of QAnon militia type people that we saw rampaging around Washington, you know, this kind of desire just to, just to burn things down and a kind of similar, almost conspiratorial mindset as well. The idea that, you know, the country like America basically a deeply white supremacist state which is just and it just that is dripping like that to its core which is america has a lot of problems but it's not that you know and there's just a kind of interesting sort of dynamic there where there was a refusal to condemn one um but a readiness to um, describe the other one not just as violent writing that was dangerous and led to the deaths of five people but domestic terrorism a coup um, an insurrection and something which should lead to the unpersoning of the then sitting president. It's, mm -hmm. you know, the, the distinctions there are, are so broad and it's just something which I think is actually going to make a lot of people who might have voted for Trump um, quite defensive in the wake of what we've seen in the course of the past week, less likely to kind of condemn what went on because they saw this huge double standard and in the quite partisan mindset I think a lot of people are in at the moment, um, that's going to kind of make them more defensive as to what's happened than they would otherwise. But because, as you say, there was this huge hypocrisy which was opened up in the summer when you had days and days and days of this carnage, but just no one saying anything about it, particularly on the case of the media and the democratic side. I mean, did you see this situation as different, as particularly dangerous? Because I don't, you know, I'm not American, so maybe I don't understand the symbolism in the same way that Americans would but I I don't I I don't know that this was necessarily any more dangerous than any other kind of violence and rioting and I mean and I I felt like I mean maybe this was just a more on an emotional or visceral level but I felt more disturbed by attacks on innocent civilians and small businesses and you know immigrant owned businesses like these people who had spent their whole lives and put everything into building up their store their business their restaurant for it to get destroyed by these rioters for no reason at all you know they don't have anything to do with 
this. They don't have anything to do with racist police violence or whatever it is these people think that they're fighting. You know, I found that more dangerous in some ways because it just seemed so lacking in direction and strategy and so misguided. Mm. No, it was really alarming. As you say, like seeing all the videos coming out from over the course of the summer where you basically just have people who spent their entire lives. And these are, broadly speaking, kind of black and minority areas, you know, which were being ripped apart night after night after night. People's livelihoods being completely, you know, raised to the ground effectively. It was some really disturbing imagery. And it's just a game when I think people are trying to, as you say, kind of pretend that one is more important than the other. I can imagine a lot of people sat in those communities, whether it's in, you know, Kenosha or Portland or anywhere else, will be really shocked by that because the kind of nihilism that seemed to be unleashed over the course of the summer, and as you say, wasn't endorsed, shall we say, by a lot of people in politics, but was kind of ignored or excuses were made for it. Mm. Or people looked the other way, you know, most famously that CNN report where the readout on the screen is most the protests are mostly peaceful. Meanwhile, the commentator has got a gas mask around his neck and flames are rising behind him. You know? <laughs> this kind of stuff is is absolutely remarkable because again, we don't want to get into a situation like which kind of political violence do we find most objectionable? I guess yeah. they're, they're different in some respects. I guess you could say, um, but yeah, the the unwillingness to reckon with what that represented, to recognise that this is not the new civil rights movement. This is something very difficult entirely I think is something that they've got on the way with frankly they've never really been called to task for it um, and that's something which I think is again going to shock a lot of people who had to live through that which went as it went on for weeks and weeks yeah and I mean I, I think that ironically the people who are opposing free speech today are on the left and in the past that wasn't the case and in you know in the past you know, leftist activism was successful because of free speech, you know, civil rights were won because of free speech, because these civil rights leaders were able to speak um, in public. I, what's been lost here, you know, what's changed over the years um, that has led the left to not only stop defending free speech, but actually in, in many cases to actively oppose free speech? Such an important question because it, it, the left nowadays give moral legitimacy to censorship. That seems to me to be a large part of what they actually spend their time doing. And it's such um, a tragedy because, as you say, the left used to be at the forefront of challenging censorship. And on the one hand, as you say, it's because a lot of very progressive movements in history had to come up against an establishment that didn't want to listen to them and wanted them to go away. Um, in the US, you know, the reason the First Amendment is, strong, is as strong as it is today is because of all of these cases brought on behalf of civil rights activists. You know, they weren't allowed to march, they weren't allowed to organise. And it was throughout the 60s and so on where the First Amendment was really given teeth, was actually um, given the kind of strength that it has today because of those people. And, you know, there's a tendency for people to think that maybe this is just a kind of partisan thing, that when censorship was mainly directed at the left or progressives, that then they were against it. But now that the kind of tables have turned, therefore, it also misses that there's a very strong history of people who are liberal and left wing who have fought for free speech, even for people they really oppose. You know, if you think about America in particular, American Civil Liberties Union, a very liberal in the in the political sense not necessarily just a philosophical sense organization they went to bat in the 1970s for the right of nazis to march through jewish towns <laughs> because they believed that free speech was that important and they recognized that the rights of civil rights activists or feminists or anyone else rested on exactly the same basis as the right of a handful of nazi weirdos um, to make their little stunt and that's gone completely. Why that has happened, I think, for some of the reasons we've already been talking about, um, on the one hand, it feels like there was always factions within the left that were slightly more authoritarian, but for whatever reason, the more kind of pro-freedom sections of it are, have almost withered to nothing. I have no idea what it is, but it's just kind of interesting how the left is now entirely synonymous with authoritarianism in a way that it wasn't previously. But I think the other thing has to do with the fact that the left, broadly speaking, has become, particularly in the UK, I'm sure it's similar in Canada, as well as the US, an increasingly um, middle to upper middle class kind of concern. It's become something which is increasingly elitist. It's become something which you increasingly associate with university faculty rather than workers. 
And as a consequence of that, they've become more and more distant from ordinary people, from what people think, to the point where they genuinely think that someone um, suggesting that whilst, I don't know, trans people should have all the rights in the world and shouldn't be discriminated against, that there is such a thing as biological sex, is tantamount to a kind of hate crime. Mm-hmm. They're that distant that they can't even take a view which is held by the vast majority of people, basically, as something other than a heresy. And I can't help but think, um, whilst I'm sure there are other kind of historical trends and influences upon that, which the increasingly kind of rarefied nature of the left and the far left in particular has just led to a position where they just do not come into contact with, understand and therefore tolerate views that differ to their own because they've, they're only ever really talking to each other in, in particularly enclosed spaces, it feels like. Yeah, they're only other talking. They're only talking to one another um, online and apparently in person too, and they don't want to talk to other people. You know, they sort of treat people who disagree with them as though they have cooties. Like if you have conversations, you know, like I, I'm accused all the time of now. I mean. I, I've always been on the left and nowadays I sort of don't want to position myself anywhere on the political spectrum because I find it not very useful. I don't find those descriptors very useful anymore. People don't seem to know what they mean. And I also don't want to be limited in my analysis, but you know, I, I talk to people who are, you know, not I mean, some of them might be on the right, but for the most part, probably they would describe themselves as liberals. Probably many of them would describe themselves as left wing. It's just that other people don't describe them as left wing. And then you get accused of being right wing simply for having conversations with these people that they disagree with. And to me, it's like, I want to have conversations with as many people as possible. I don't care where they are on the political spectrum. But it's it's weird to me that just... I suppose not being hateful towards people that you disagree with politically or that you're meant to disagree with politically um, turns you into a villain or a bigot or a right winger or whatever. Um, I, where I don't know where do you where do you position yourself on the political spectrum? Do you position well, yourself? <laughs> I agree with you in the sense that the labels are increasingly meaningless, or at least useless, particularly for people like ourselves. Because, again, I always consider myself left-wing. Spike, the magazine that I work for, I know Brendan, my editor, has been on the show before, um, again, come from a, uh, comes from a left-wing tradition. But at the same time, essentially, if you're in favour of freedom of speech, you're considered far-right these mm-hmm. days. Um, again, the kind of guilt by association is so intense. And as you say, it's not even necessarily just being nice to people who you might disagree with sometimes it's just defending the right of someone you disagree with to speak that's enough of a kind of proximity to make you persona non grata and and not welcome on the left it feels like and you know this is a point that's been made many times but it does feel like um the dividing lines are not what they used to be um whereas the left right kind of economic distinction shall we say made a lot more sense in working out where the real kind of live issues and fault lines were in society or in politics at least a little while ago now it definitely does feel that it is about your relationship with freedom with democracy to a to a less degree potentially but still those are kind of where people end up kind of clustering together where um people who are concerned about censorship who are concerned by this kind of identity politics which seems to be dividing us up constantly a lot of people who are concerned about that are actually left-wing and liberal. They just don't often talk about it so much. It's not something that is just dominated by right-wingers. And I think, again, we could spend all day um, trying to kind of like reclaim these terms. I think it's important to a degree. I think we should demonstrate to people and explain to people the kind of left-wing history of a lot of the ideas that we're currently defending. But at the same time, I don't know what use it is often because the the terms have been so changed to the point where if you're anti-fascist, it basically means you want to burn books these days. And... (laughs) If you're looking <laughs> that you want to constantly agitate for giant corporations to decide what it is that we can say and hear, I don't know how useful these terms are anymore. So on the one hand, I do you do have this tendency to want to kind of like make the case for a kind of more genuinely progressive kind of left wing politics, which isn't so authoritarian and censorious, but at the same time, it doesn't seem to get you very far these days. No, I mean people people do that to me a lot where they say, you know, cause I'm very critical of the left. Um, and I always have been, this isn't like new for me. Um, but I mean, maybe I've doubled down a bit more. Um, 
but people say, oh, don't, this isn't the real left. This isn't, these people aren't really left-wing people. These are actually neoliberals or these are actually liberals or whatever. And I, I'm just like, I mean, I don't know. I, this is, this is who the left is now. I would like it not to be true, but you know, this is what people see um, this is what people think of when they think of the left. These are the people who identify themselves as leftist, leftists. These are also the people who are involved in with left-wing parties. Mm -hmm. So whether you like it or not, these are the people who are attached to labor, um, who are attached to, in Canada, the NDP, or our left-wing party, our labor party, um, who are supporters of the Democrats and who are engaging in what we now understand to be left-wing activism. So I don't, I don't really want to argue about the terms. I don't really see the point. I mean, to me, it's just more productive to talk about ideas. But when you do that and you don't go around insisting that you're left-wing all the time, then people say, oh, well, you're not left-wing, so I guess you must be on the right. Um, I'm sure that must happen to you all the time, does it? No, it's inc it's incredibly frustrating. I get less and less bothered by it. I think as the years go on, because it just <laughs> becomes so increasingly absurd. But I think it's kind of interesting as well, because as you were talking about there, people try and make this distinction. I think pe particularly people who are on the kind of more traditional left, who recognise some of the problems, you know, with identity politics or with some of the censoriousness or whatever have you, who try and to make this distinction between kind of like you know, the sort of leadership of the Democratic Party, say, and the kind of more socialistic kind of, you know, Bernie Sanders wing of it or whatever. But what I'm increasingly um, recognising is the fact that those two wings, if you like, have a lot more in common than they often like to admit. Like on the identity politics question, yes, you know, Hillary Clinton approached the 2016 election in a very kind of identitarian way, trying to speak to the electorate as kind of individual identity groups, um, trying to, again, you see a figure like Kamala Harris, um, the... Um, soon to be vice president, who is someone who really comes from the kind of right of the party, um, has the backing of Wall Street and Silicon Valley and all the rest of it. But again, through identity politics, tries to take on this quite progressive sheen and tries to just present her presence in politics as a great breakthrough for mankind, basically, on the basis of her sort of identity. Um, but at the same time, all of those prejudices really, particularly amongst the kind of like younger left wing activist set, they hold all of those views as well. I mean, the, you know, the neoliberals, as it were, might have kind of um, borrowed it to give themselves a bit of a progressive sheen, but they agree on a lot of that stuff. And the other thing they agree on is censorship. You know, you had the democratic establishment have been agitating for these um, social media companies to clamp down on speech because of the, you know, the Russia scandal or because they felt like political ads were misleading and were spreading misinformation about them or whatever. But for very similar reasons, you know, the kind of AOCs of this world have been demanding Facebook and other companies do things similarly. Increasingly, I think people try to make a distinction between the kind of center left, shall we say, and the more traditionally radical left. But actually, on some of the most important issues of our time, they have very similar views, actually. Um, and uh, as you say, people try and split it up. But that is what the left kind of means right now. Um, you might decide to side with those parties on other reasons, economic reasons, whatever, that's fine. But at the same time, on the issues that we're talking about and on the issues that I think are amongst the most important that we have to deal with today, they are all kind of singing from the same hymn sheet, as it were. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, there was this major debate among feminists that around the election saying that, you know, you can't, you can't support Trump, you can't vote for Trump. I think there's a difference between supporting Trump and voting for Trump. I think a lot of people voted for Trump who didn't necessarily support, for, support Trump. You know, like, I don't think that everyone who voted for Trump loved Trump and thought that he was a great guy. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, but the, the dislike, the hatred for, you know, or the fear of Biden and Kamala Harris, like, which was I'm luckily I'm not in the US so I didn't have to make that kind of decision but to me on the issues that mattered I felt like you know I or I you know I I changed my mind about this leading up to the election you know within just a few weeks before because I've just always I've always had that visceral reaction to Trump where I just hate him you know like I I watch him in a debate and I'm like you're such a bully like you're such a jerk like you're such an idiot I can't like I can't I'm, I can't I could never bring myself to vote for you 
But leading up to the election, I was like, I think that these guys, Biden and mm. Harris, I think these guys are more dangerous. And and then, of course, the same thing happens when you say things like that. People say like, oh, you're a Trump supporter. You're a mm. fascist. But, you know, it to me, it's like you're in this situation where your options suck and um you know but there is this thing where it's like you have you have to support the democrats if you're a feminist if you're a leftist if you're anti-racist if you're not a misogynist and to me it just wasn't as simple as that at all and i was really concerned about the way that people were not seeing the big picture you know to me there was the issue of sex-based rights and the gender identity ideology stuff but there was the also the issue of big tech and free speech and the response to covid and the lockdowns and all these other things that that really do matter in the long term mm -hmm. you know this isn't just about the short-term issues. It's not even just about what these two men say in public. It's about the long-term impacts of what they're going to do and who who they're beholden to. Mm. And I think on that point, it's really interesting as well to see the kind of gap between the kind of discussion in the media and amongst kind of people in politics, in a kind of broad sense, you know, people who think of themselves as politically engaged or activists or whatever and what actually shook out in terms of the vote. Because as you say, the election was kind of framed in kind of moral terms almost. You know, this was a fight between civilization and barbarism. This was a fight between uh, evil and goodness. This was a fight between, you know, anti-racism and, and racism effectively. And as you say, I think a lot of people who might have been incredibly skeptical of um, Joe Biden, of the kind of right wing of the, of the Democratic Party or whatever, felt that they did have to just kind of hold their nose and, and vote for this and kind of bought the, the narrative. But if you look at what actually happened in the country, it's a very different story. You know, everyone knows this now, but obviously the fact that Donald Trump did better amongst every single group other than white men effectively um, that you got the highest proportion of the African-American vote. It just shows you that other people's priorities are not these kind of moral pearl-clutching issues. I don't mean to actually you know, denigrate them. Trump has said some horrendous things. He's done some horrendous things. His predecessors have arguably done more horrendous things, but we can kind of get onto that. Um, people care about their livelihoods. People care about the lockdown, I think, was another issue. You know, if you have Joe Biden basically coming in suggesting that he wanted to locked down until five years after the coronavirus has completely been eradicated. That was the kind of level of his campaigning. People who, of any kind of background, who were just struggling to, to make ends meet, do you not think that's going to concern them? There was just such a disjoint, I think, between the issues that people were kind of pearl clutching over and the, the kind of bread and butter issues. And this is what Trump appealed to so effectively in the first place, was the fact that there were a lot of people who have been fed a lot of these kind of like moral shibboleths, if you like, but still felt that they'd been ignored and left behind on some of those core issues that their communities were going to shit, that they weren't being listened to, that they were being demonized even. And in the privacy of a voting booth, very different things happen to what you know the commentators and, and the politicos think are the big issues. He did lose, obviously, um, but the fact that you know he's got the second highest popular vote of all time and, the, and where he got those votes from, I think, tells us something about the gap between where we're what we're told the question of an election is or what we're told the big issue of the day is and where most people actually are as it shakes up. Right, exactly. And I mean, it does, again, show the disconnect between what 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 progressives want and what they they believe or what they'd like to believe about the population and about real people and, and their concerns are versus what the concerns of real people actually are, which is, you know, pretty basic stuff, employment, you know, survival, being able to take care of your family, debt, healthcare. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess it just seems as far as I can tell, the, the hope that there's ever going to be any kind of unity is just disappearing more and more each day i feel like it's getting worse and i feel like biden who'd like to present himself as the guy who wants to unify instead of create division you know often trump is the one who's blamed for creating division and he did create division but he was not the only one you know the media played a large part in that <clears throat> progressives play a large part in that um activist groups play a large part in that these social media companies play a large part in that. 
And it's frustrating to me that people can't see that they're contributing to the very thing that they claim to oppose, which is, you know, division, violence, mm -hmm. hatred, bigotry. Um, you know, people, people like to say words like inclusivity and diversity, when as far as I can tell, those very people are completely opposed to mm. diversity and inclusivity and acceptance. No, it's, it's so true. I mean, it's incredible the kind of hostility that people have to just people having a different opinion, really, um, which is such a kind of basic, you would think, of anyone who was in, into inclusive or diverse politics. But, it's, it, you know, you talk about division. And I think the one thing that we really can't get away from, because obviously, you know, Trump over the course of the past few years, he has on occasion kind of nodded and winked at some bad people. Um, we saw that kind of most explicitly, I guess, over the course of the past week. But at the same time, this year in particular, something which has really driven a wedge between people and made things really tense was, I think, the kind of blossoming of um, this kind of work identity politics, or at least the kind of burnishing of it over the course of the kind of post-George Floyd moment, by which I don't mean people's concern about police brutality, people's concern about very real issues of racial inequality in the US or anywhere else, but the fact that discussion very quickly became about something quite different. It became about censorship, it became about white privilege, it became about the idea that all of these different nations, many of which, despite having their problems, you know, are some of the best, most diverse kind of democracies on the planet, um, were just irredeemably racist and foul places. All of this, I think, has been really divisive. And yet this is an agenda which has been completely supported by the Democrats, by the Labour Party in the UK, by people who consider themselves liberal and left wing, the culture establishment more broadly have completely bought all of these ideas. And yet this is something which has proved really, really divisive. I think it's interesting as well, kind of the way identity politics, particularly racial identity politics, this kind of desire to constantly kind of focus on what separates individuals on the basis of um, skin color, kind of constantly wanting to talk about what relative privilege one group has to another and really to focus on that as a great divide. What's interesting is I think that plays the same role anti-racist politics such as it is plays the same role that racist politics used to in some respects insofar as it's something which is dividing up working people in particular which is trying to take a group of people whose interests broadly speaking are very very similar they might experience slightly different struggles in society slightly different issues affect them but at the same time their economic interests the lack of power that they experience is broadly the same but at the same time they're being broken up and, and made and encouraged to be antagonistic towards one another because they're white, they're more privileged than you, or vice versa, and whatever. And it's just, that's a form of politics which is very divisive, which I think has been a real block to a kind of genuine class politics emerging, which some people have been trying to trying to do in recent years and, and failing at it, it feels like. Mm -hmm. And that, which has originated from the left. We can talk about Trump and what he's done on his own terms, but I think it's, it's so important that that, the kind of post-BLM movement moment in particular, and the way in which it really created genuine division amongst people is something that really needs to be reckoned with because unlike trump and trumpism whatever it is and whatever the shortcomings of it you know it's that's not something which enjoys kind of support and um trumpeting amongst you know the kind of influential sections of society far from it whereas this form of very divisive politics is something that we're told is the new orthodoxy basically which makes it even more difficult to challenge yeah, I mean, it's interesting because the right and, and Trump is is still presented as, you know, the man, mm -hmm. um, those with the power and we need to fight the power. But it seems to me that that's not true anymore. I mean, culturally, politically, in the media, in academia, in institutions, in 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 North America, it's it's the left. Mm -hmm. that has power, not the right. I mean, and I think that we can kind of see that clearly in these bans, in these this like censorship of right-wing and conservative people and organizations and views. Mm -hmm. You know, these are no longer the dominant, this is no longer the dominant ideology. These aren't the people who hold power in society, I don't think. I think that's really true because for a long time, I think people would kind of make the distinction which you know, the right might have economic or political power, but the left kind of have cultural power. You know, they're, they're very influential in uh, academia, as you say, or in kind of the arts or cultural, whatever, the activist set. But I think what we've seen over the course of the past year, again, in the kind of wake of the George Floyd protest, 
is the fact that identity politics in particular and kind of woke politics has become the establishment ideology. You know, we weren't just seeing politicians expressing their fealty to this. JP Morgan, you know, the, one of their CEOs posed taking the knee in front of an empty bank vault. You know, you had all of these different corporations falling over themselves to express solidarity with this movement. And if you thought that that was just them saying um, police racism is bad, then that you would obviously think that was no bad thing. But we all know that there's more to it. It's a kind of deeper ideology. It's, it's a focus on identity, the idea that we are separated out into completely different experiences, that our interests are fundamentally different, that we're fundamentally antagonistic to, to one another. All of this stuff is what has been rubber stamped, not just by the kind of cultural establishment, but by the economic establishment, by some of the richest people in society. And I think getting to grips with why that has happened um, leads us to understand how kind of unthreatening to actual power and the establishment identitarian kind of politics is. Now, obviously, when people are roaming around kind of setting fire to buildings and things, that is a bit of a threat. But <laughs> the, the embrace of it, I think, demonstrates the fact that this focus on identity rather than an issue like class, this focus basically on culture rather than economics and, and capital, it's very easy for the genuinely powerful people in society to co-opt that because all they've got to do is hire some more diversity managers. They've got to issue some sort of apology for any kind of past wrongs that they may or may not have been tangentially involved in. Um, they've got to put on you know, white privilege workshops for their staff and then you're fine. <laughs> That's, it's a lot of this, the demands that it makes of people is kind of all talk and theatre, which I think is why it's been so readily taken up by a lot of these corporations is because on the one hand, it does make demands of them. But on the other hand, it doesn't. It's very easy for them to look incredibly progressive by saying very, very little. And I think that's one of the reasons why, as you say, at this point, this kind of ideology, which passes as left wing, but is actually very regressive in many respects, has gone from being something which was just dominated academia or just dominated the media to something which even the most richest people in our society can sign up to, because really they don't have to give anything up by signing up to this. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, back to the free speech issue, and I'll let you go soon. Um, do you think that there should be any limits on free speech? So I'm a free speech absolutist, really. Um, and for the simple reason, I think free speech is either free or it isn't. As soon as you start making caveats to it, it stops being free speech and it starts being licensed speech. And I think a lot of the examples that people bring up are things which aren't really to do with free speech at all. We're talking a bit about incitement to violence. You know, that is something where, particularly if you take the kind of First Amendment definition of that, that's basically your kind of um, role in a violent crime. <laughs> this is not something which is just purely about speech. There are loads of crimes that involve speech. Lying on your tax return is a crime that involves speech, but it's not the main thrust of it. When we're talking about people being able to express their view, to express themselves, it's something that you can't put any limits on, I don't think, because you soon do start falling down that slippery slope. And I think going back to the kind of big tech things that we talked about, the fact that you had all these um, platforms start from a position of wanting to be as liberal as possible because it just allowed them to you know, get the heat off their backs, basically, allowed them not to have to make tough decisions about what goes up and what isn't. Over the course of the past few years, you've seen that as soon as they give an inch to the people demanding that they need more censorship, it's natural that it goes further and further and further to the point where they're censoring the president of the United States. So it's an absurd example, but I think it does demonstrate that as soon as you start making arguments as to why it needs to be limited in this particular area, soon the whole kind of edifice starts to crumble. And I think in its own kind of absurd way, the big tech stories of the past couple of years have demonstrated that in some ways. Mm -hmm. How do we move forward in the media in particular, you know, I feel like it's becoming scary it's to, to cover certain issues and to just talk about certain ideas. Um, you know, you don't even have to share your opinion necessarily. You can do an interview with somebody and their opinion can be reason for censorship. Um, what do we do so that we can, I mean, we obviously don't want to get banned from the internet, but at the same time, it's our job to be truthful and to seek truth and to, to cover issues in an accurate and critical way. Mm. It's such a difficult issue. As you say, there's some things which are going to take a lot of kind of political action. Like we're talking about some of the big issues around like, big tech censorship, where that begins and ends. That's something which is a huge issue. But I think on, on the kind of specifics of how do we get away from this climate in particular, in which even just 
stating facts is enough for you to be denounced as aligned to this regressive tendency or whatever, you know, even to just bring up the riots that happened in the summer is tantamount to a hate crime for some people, you know, even as you say to interview certain people. I remember there's one guy, I forget his name, but he was some sort of democratic staffer, sort of data analyst guy who just shared a study in the course of the summer, which purported to say that um, the Republicans always benefit electorally when there are when there is unrest in cities. And off the base of that, he lost his job, even just stating a fact. So this is something that a lot of people have to deal with, not just on social media, but in their kind of daily lives and their professional lives. Um, and beyond the kind of bigger questions of how do you roll back big tech censorship or anything else, it I think it does just come down to the fact that people do have to be braver. I'm sure you get this sort of message all the time or, you know, after you speak somewhere or whatever, you get someone who will kind of come up to you and say, thank you for saying what you say, because, you know, myself, I find it difficult, difficult to do that, whatever. It is just going to take more and more people, particularly people in positions of influence, to just pluck up the courage to s tell the truth, really. I think that's so much of what it comes down to. It's not easy. Um, it can be very difficult. I'm not expecting everyone to wage this war in their daily lives every day. People have other priorities. But I think particularly if you work in the media, particularly if you have a platform of some kind or another, if you recognise the things that are going on, which are very liberal, um, very regressive, and feel like they get stronger day by day, you do need to say something about it. Um, and as worrying as a lot of the clampdowns that we're seeing recently are, I think there's still a kind of growing appetite for that. And, and we're seeing that grow every day because more and more people are recognising the situation that we find ourselves in, um, which is the difficulty of not just expressing opinion, but even just pointing out facts at this point, which is something that, of course, you yourself have had direct experience of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you so much for talking with me today. I really um, enjoyed this conversation and I really appreciate your time and, and your work. No problem at all. Thanks for having me. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. See you.